Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Ty, and I'm an educator here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, and I'm really excited to be joining you this morning to talk about one of my favorite habitats, one that is local to us, one that I've gotten to personally explore myself, and that is the kelp forest. Now, just like every week, we would love to hear if you have any questions about anything we talk about, if you have any observations to share, we would love if you would share them with us. We have a number that you can use that we'll throw up on the screen now. So feel free to text us live at 562-286-1838. And if you happen to miss the stream, that is okay as well. You can email us at any time at live at lbaop.org. Now, like I said, today we're gonna be exploring a local habitat to us here in Long Beach, and that is the kelp forest. And then we're going to highlight some of the really cool animals that call it home. And then we'll talk about some ways that we can help to protect this habitat. So what I want to do now is switch and look at one of our uh, webcams that we have here at the aquarium. And we'll go ahead and throw that on. And our exhibit here that we're now showing up is a habitat based on a kelp forest. Not only based on just any kelp forest, but a real one that is located off of Catalina Island. And this dive site is called Blue Cavern and it is home to many, many hundreds of different types of fish and invertebrates. And so what I would like you all to do now is take a couple seconds to see what you notice about this habitat, see what catches your eye, and then we'll explore some of the different components of a kelp forest. Now, as you can see, uh, our friend there on the right of the screen, that is one of our giant sea bass. And although it looks like he wants all of the attention this morning, we will, we will highlight him definitely, but for now, go ahead and try and look past him on our left side and see what else you notice about the habitat itself. Now, one of the things that really sticks out to me when I'm looking at a kelp forest, especially here in our exhibit, is just how many rocks are all around. You may notice a giant boulder on the left, and if you look all around the background of the habitat, there is rocks all the way up and down. Now, rocks at first glance may seem unimportant or boring, but I promise my friends that those rocks are a very, very important component of this habitat. Now, like I said, our friend the giant sea bass is a little bit in the way, but if you look over there, you'll see that there's rocks all the way up and down and down here as well. Now, the rocks are really important because it provides a hard surface, a hard structure for the kelp itself to attach to, because you can't have a kelp forest without the kelp. And so kelp is a sort of um, the baseline of the food chain of a kelp forest. It provides um, a lot of the initial energy in the system. And it's a really, really interesting organism that I want to explore first. So what I want to do is actually go over to our document cam and show you why that rocky surface is so important. Because kelp, although it looks a whole lot like a plant, and it behaves a whole lot like a plant too, it is technically a type of algae. So there are some key differences in it including the fact that it does not have roots that dig into the soil like the plants do on land, but instead has a different structure called a holdfast. So now if we can, I'd like to switch over to our document cam to show you what one of these holdfasts actually looks like. Now this is a real one that has been sort of dried out a bit, as you can see, but it's really interesting to show just how much structure is sort of built by this holdfast. Because like I said, instead of it going and burrowing into into dirt or soil like on land, it just attaches itself to a hard surface. Now, kelp provides lots of habitat, not only up in the leaves, but also down here in the holdfast. You can see with all these tiny little nooks and crannies in the holdfast that there are lots of small, small critters that will call this portion of the kelp their home. Everything from maybe some small snails to things like brittle stars, lots of tiny animals, um, love to live inside of the holdfast here. Now, not only is kelp a place for little things to hide, but there are lots of things that like to eat it as well. But before we go to that, I want to show you some other components of, of kelp. And so if I move this holdfast aside here for a second, I have another, although not real, a model of some kelp so I can point out some other cool key structures. So like I said, it looks a whole lot like a plant, but some of the structures are a little bit different. And so instead of having a stem like a plant, we call this the stipe. And then instead of having leaves, we call these the blades. Now, they do perform photosynthesis like plants do on land. So they use the sunlight to get energy. And so that's another insight into our kelp forest habitat. You know now that that means it must be at least in water that's shallow enough for the sun to, to enter the habitat. If it's way too deep, it gets too dark, 
you won't be able to find any giant kelp. So photosynthesis will take place in these blades. And then if you look where the blade attaches to the stipe, you'll see lots of these little um, sort of circular structures attached to each one. And then up at the very top, if I can flip this around, uh, maybe this one doesn't actually have it, but sometimes on the top of them, you'll find a whole, looks like they have broken up. You'll find a whole series of these little bubbles as well. Now, what these are, these are called pneumatocysts. And pneumatocysts are little gas bladders. So these little things are filled with gas and that provides them with an interesting ability. Now, if we go back to our, our camera there, our live view of Blue Cavern, let's go ahead and take a look at the kelp. Or actually, um, if we have a video, I think we have some a really cool shot of some kelp kind of swaying back and forth. Yeah, this one here. So if we take a look on here, you'll notice that the kelp is swaying back and forth. You can see the sunlight coming in, right? Because it needs that sunlight to get its energy. But also you can see that the giant kelp is standing straight up. Now those gas bladders, since they get filled with gas with air, it allows them to sort of float. They act like tiny floats that keep the kelp upright so that it can maintain its structure and then, as we talked about earlier, there's habitat down below, but also habitat up in all these leaves. Lots of baby fish especially will live within the kelp. And if you look closely, maybe it's kind of hard to see in our video here, but you'll see that kelp can actually sort of overgrow and form these canopies up on top, like over in this area here. And that is great, great hiding spots for lots of baby fish. Now, like I mentioned, there's lots of animals that rely on the kelp, not only for habitat, but for food as well. And so one of the cool creatures I want to point out to you is called the sea urchin. Now, sea urchins are these tiny little spiky creatures, although some can get kind of big. Here's one right here. Here's a sea urchin. This is a purple sea urchin, one that is local to here in Southern California. Now, these spiky creatures, if you take a look, maybe take some observations real quick and see what kind of things you notice. One of the things that always catches my eye about these sea urchins is those spines. Now in the purple sea urchins, like you see here, they're pretty small, but there are other types of urchins where the spikes can get really, really huge. Now those spikes help to protect them so that they're not really eaten by very many things. Now if you take a look underneath our sea urchin friend here, you can see that he is currently munching on some kelp. So a kelp is a favorite, favorite food source for sea urchins. Their mouth is underneath them, so you can't really see it in the picture. It's in the center and on the underside and they love to eat away at the kelp, and they love to also eat away at the holdfast, that structure we looked at earlier that keeps it attached. Now, sea urchins, if there's nothing eating them, then they can actually form really, really big population numbers, and they have the potential to eat away at the kelp. And if they eat away kelp completely, then, you, then that loses the habitat for all the other animals that rely on it, and it creates what's called an urchin barren. Urchin barrens are when the kelp has been completely wiped out and all you would see on the rocky floor is just hundreds or thousands and thousands of urchins. And that has happened in some places. But there are some predators that help to sort of be the guardians of the kelp forest. And so I want to highlight some of those now. And one of my favorite ones to talk about is the California sheephead. Let's see if we can maybe throw a picture of our sheephead friend up on the screen. Yeah, let's take a look at this guy. So this is one that we have personally here at the aquarium. And California sheephead, they do start off very, very tiny, like many fish do, but they can get pretty big. Now, one of the things that's really cool about sheephead, though, that makes them so interesting, is that they're part of a group of fish called the wrasse family. And the wrasses, they all start out as girls. So all of them are born as girls, but when some get big enough, they will, some of them will transition and actually become males, like this one here. So the females are a little bit smaller, their head shape is a little more smooth, and they're normally like a grayish sort of pinkish. This one looks like he's actually sort of almost in between. So you can see the head shape is a lot different. It's a lot smoother and they can be sort of a grayish or even pinkish um, coloration. But if we go back to our big male or one that has fully switched over, you can see his head is more squared off. He has a bright white jaw and then they form the really dark face, really dark tail, and then a pinkish body in the center. Now when sheephead are tiny, they'll feed on small little crustaceans and other little critters that live in the kelp forest. But when they get big enough, they actually have really, really strong teeth. I'm not sure if we have a picture of it, but maybe you can see that down here in his little white jaw, there are some big, big teeth. And those are really, really strong. And they're capable of actually opening up that really hard, spiny um, structure of a sea urchin. And so they're one of the few fish that when they get big enough, they can eat 
um, sea urchins to help keep their populations in check. Now there's another very famous predator of sea urchins that everyone sort of knows and loves, at least I know that we all do here at the aquarium, and that is the sea otter. So maybe we can go ahead and switch over to our adorable friend here. Now we don't have sea otters here uh, in Long Beach, for example, down in Southern California, but you can still find sea otters in the kelp forest near Central California. Now, the reason that you no longer find them here, because in the past, they did reside here in Southern California. In fact, there was hundreds of thousands of them all the way from Baja, California, all the way around the Pacific Rim towards Japan. But back in the early, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, they were hunted for their fur. And because of that, their populations declined rapidly. Now, in the kelp forest, the water needs to be very, very cold. Kelp prefers these cold, nutrient-rich waters in order to grow, but that means that the animals that live in this habitat need to have ways to cope with the cold, cold water. And like I said, they were hunted for their fur because their fur was really, really special. Now, if we can, let's actually go ahead and switch over to our document camera again, because I have a little sample. I want to sort of show you the a little sample of some of this fur here. Now, sea urchins actually, or sea urchins, sea otters actually have the densest fur of any mammal on the planet. So if you can take just about a square inch, so about that big on a sea otter's body, you can get anywhere from about 600,000 to about 1 million hairs. Now that is a lot of air, or a lot of hair. And what it does is it actually sort of has two layers and what it does is it will trap air within the fur. And so when it traps those air inside all of these, in all of these different um, uh, layers of hair, it allows the sea otter's body to warm it up, acting sort of like a dry suit, if we have any scuba divers out there. It's sort of a similar idea, where if you have a suit, you have some air in between your body and the suit, your body heats it up, and then it keeps you warm. Now, because they were hunted, their populations declined rapidly. And when you lose sea otters, you lose a key predator in the kelp forest. Now, fortunately though, the sea otter is now protected, and we're gonna hopefully, here's an adorable video of one, munching away at something, maybe not a sea urchin, but um, one of the other invertebrates, like a crab or a shrimp or clam that sea otters love to munch on. But when you lose those key predators, you can actually see the kelp forest health overall start to decline. And so in many pieces, in many parts of California, we've lost bits of kelp forest because we, when we lose these key predators, you allow things like the sea urchin to grow in really big numbers, and you lose the kelp forest, and then you lose the habitat for all the other animals that rely on it. And so because of this, sea otters are considered a keystone species. And what that means is that they're responsible for sort of keeping the balance of the ecosystem. They may not have, you know, thousands and thousands of them, but even having a small amount of them there can really change the balance of the ecosystem. And when they're present, you get healthier kelp forests. Now, sea otters also have another cool adaptation that they use to stay warm out there in the kelp forest, and that is being demonstrated here by our friend who's munching away at some food, and that is their diet. They eat lots and lots of food every single day. Like I said, they'll feed on lots of different kinds of small invertebrates that live at the bottom of the kelp forest, so fish, for example, is not something that they would really eat. In fact, if you came and visited our aquarium, you would see that in our sea otter habitat, we have some fish, some yellowtails, swimming along in the exhibit with them. And the sea otters aren't really interested because fish isn't something they like to eat. Instead, they go down, they dive all the way down to the bottom of the kelp forest where you would find like that hold fast structure. And they look for small crabs, clams, abalone, other types of snails, things like that. And of course, our sea urchins too. And they need to eat a lot of it. They'll eat about 25% of their body weight every single day. Now to put that in perspective, that means that for every pound you weigh, you'd have to eat a cheeseburger for that. So for example, if you weighed 100 pounds, you'd have to eat 100 cheeseburgers every single day to match what our sea otters are eating. And that helps them have a fast metabolism so that they can keep heating up their body, keep their temperature stable, and then of course, allow them to use the, all that energy to do things like groom that very, very wonderful fur. Now, if we can, let's go ahead and go back to our camera, our blue cavern, uh, highlight video and let's take some other observations. Let's see what else we can notice about our habitat here. Now, I think it's probably time we acknowledge our our guy who loves the camera here, very camera famous. These guys actually love looking at the reflection in our little cameras that we have inside of our exhibit. So I think it's time we give them a little bit of attention. 
So these are called giant sea bass. And if you see their size as they're swimming around here, especially compared to the, some of the other fish that you may see swim past them, you'll see that the name is very fitting. They are giant indeed. Not always, they actually start off very, very tiny. I'm not sure if we have an image of them when, we're, when they're little, but they look a little bit different and they're only about the size of like the tip of your finger. So they start off very, very tiny. They have these brown spots, but then after a few years, they'll grow, grow, grow and get to a massive size like this guy here. Now at their max, they can get over 500 pounds. There's even been some that we believe to get up to around 700 pounds and about seven feet long at their longest. So these guys are huge, huge fish. Now, if we go back to our camera and watch them swim, swim, swim around a little bit, you'll notice that, especially for our ones that love being in front of the camera, that they're not very, they're not very quick. They're just kind of <laughs> being a little lazy, swimming around kind of slowly. Now, believe it or not, these big guys are capable of some quick speeds when they need to, but other than that, they just sort of glide around the kelp forest if they're not in a hurry to go anywhere. But because of that, they're very brave too. They don't have a lot of natural predators once they get so big. But when spear fishermen were going down over the past hundred years or so and looking for these big, big fish, they weren't really scared. They didn't really dart away. And so it made them a very easy target for fishing. Now, unfortunately, the spear fishing was so, so prevalent that it also caused Kind of like the sea otters had a big decline because of the fur trade, the giant sea bass had a really big decline because they were hunted so easily. And of course, fishermen want to get these, you know, really big, cool fish to show off. But because of that, their numbers plummeted as well, almost to the point that we feared that they had gone completely extinct. Now, fortunately, though, as you can see, our giant sea bass are still around. And there are some key programs and different um, forms of legislation that have been put in place to help our giant sea bass. So out in the wild, um, we've put a moratorium on fishing. So the giant sea bass is not a fish that can be fished anymore. That's a really good thing to help them come back because even though um, they get really, really big, it takes some time to get there. So they need to have lots and lots of time and safety before they can reach their big sizes. Now, another thing that is really, really important, not only for protecting the giant sea bass, but for protecting all of our ocean backyard, all of our kelp forest, is the creation of marine protected areas or MPAs. Now, marine protected areas are these designated zones where there is, for example, no fishing, there's no take, there's minimized boat activity or no boat activity. There's lots of different classifications of marine protected areas, but essentially there are these zones where we want to minimize or completely reduce any sort of human impact. And what that does is it creates a safe haven for a lot of these fish, especially these low, these slow growing fish like is a safe place for them to grow and it keeps the habitat nice and healthy by reducing any sort of impact and like i said this can include lots and lots of things like even just taking of shells right all these tiny little details make sure that these habitats stay pristine that can be utilized by all of our different animals now parts of our california coastline have been designated as mpas in these sort of disjunct areas and not only do they allow a safe place for our giant sea bass to grow but it also means that there can be uh, benefits for fishermen as well, right? Lots of people like to eat seafood and that is okay. And so if we want to responsibly manage our fisheries, one of the things we can do is create these MPAs. Because if, in addition to having wild caught fisheries, if we create these designated areas where, for example, lots of babies are born and they get healthy and they grow up, lots of them will actually move beyond the boundaries of the MPAs. And that means more fish for our fishermen too. So it's a win-win. And we're hoping that in the future we can continue to create more of these marine protected areas um, around not only California, but around the world as well. Now, there's one other cool thing I wanna share with you about our giant sea bass friend who's currently coming up here next to me. He wants some more attention. And that is that at, here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, we have a really cool uh, connection with these animals. We were the very first public aquarium to actually hatch and raise successfully a baby giant sea bass. And he currently resides here at the aquarium in a habitat called Amber Forest, which I believe maybe we do have um, a little video of here it is so this is the amber forest exhibit that if you came and visited us you would be able to meet yutaka now he's about i believe just over five six years he's sort of in that range now so he's getting a little bit big but like i said when they start off they're super super tiny but because of that we are able to learn a whole lot about the giant sea bass about how they reproduce about how to raise them and yutaka has taught us a whole lot now while he still resides here at the aquarium 
that information has helped us to form partnerships with other organizations that have now helped to actually raise giant sea bass babies in different aquariums and other facilities. And then those have actually been outplanted or released in the wild to help um, boost their populations as well. And so we're going to hope that their populations continue to increase because the giant sea bass is a local favorite and another key predator in the kelp forest. But let's go ahead and go back. Oh, here's a baby. Let's check this out real quick. You can see they do have that spotted pattern, but they're more of a brown color. And like I said, it may be hard to see in the scale um, just in the picture, but these guys start off super, super tiny. All right, let's go ahead and go back to our camera if we can. Um, back to our Blue Cavern camera. And I want to take a look one more time at those adults that are swimming around and some other things. We'll see if we can catch anything else going by. Now you'll notice once they get to that adult stage, they'll actually change into that sort of dark gray color, sort of dark gray on top, a little bit lighter gray underneath, and they have those black spotting patterns. Now if you take a look over on the left, you'll see one swimming right in front of those rocks. Now not only for the giant sea bass, but take a look all around and look at the colors of the fish that you see. And you may notice that for the most part, there's not really any bright colored ones and not really any bright blues or yellows or pinks or anything like that. But a lot of them are sort of these gray or greenish colors. And you can see that that helps them to camouflage in the kelp forest habitat, especially when they swim right in front of those rocks. You can see that they almost get sort of hard to see. Now, swimming right by in the middle there is a leopard shark. So I think since he swam by, we should take a moment to highlight one of our local, another local star of ours, the leopard shark. Perhaps we have some pictures we can show it for you. Awesome. So that, like I said, it's a local shark to us here in California, and they are really awesome to see in dives. I've been fortunate enough to go scuba diving um, around our kelp forest here in California, and I've seen a handful of these leopard sharks. They're a whole lot of fun to be around. Now, leopard sharks, like all sharks, are a little bit different than other kinds of fish that we've highlighted today. The ones that we've looked at, like the sheephead and the giant sea bass, those are all considered bony fish, and that means that they have bones, kind of like we do. Now, a shark, on the other hand, sharks and rays, they're called cartilaginous fish. And that means that while they still have bones, their whole skeleton is made out of cartilage, kind of like the stuff that's in your ears and your nose. And because of that, when you see them swimming around, you'll notice they swim a little bit different. They're a little more flexible, and they're also pretty light for their size, too. But that's what makes sharks and rays different from other kinds of fish. Now, our leopard shark here, we do have on exhibit, as you saw. And these guys are really interesting. They're um, one of the only sharks that actually gets hand-fed by the divers. Divers go right up to them, give them some food, and it's okay because their, their jaws are actually a little bit different than what you might expect from a shark. Because not all sharks have really, really sharp, pointy teeth and eat fish. Leopard sharks, on the other hand, you may notice, you can't really see his mouth on the tip. It's actually underneath here. And they have sort of small teeth that are really good at grinding open hard-shelled items like crabs and clams and other things, other things that have a hard shell. So their diet is very different than what you might expect from a shark, but that's how they get around in the kelp forest. You'll see them swimming all around sort of the middle. They'll, they'll go up, up top to the canopy sometimes, and then when it's time to eat, they'll go down towards the bottom and look for little kind of critters roaming around at the bottom of the kelp forest. Let's go ahead and go back to our camera. We got just a few minutes here. See if we can point out any cool animals that are going to swim on by. <laughs> Maybe we can switch to our amber forest, actually. Let's take another <laughs> look in there while our friend here is being a little bit of a camera hog. Now, all these different kinds of fish that you see in here are different types of, of rockfish. And rockfish are another staple here in the kelp forest. There's many, many different species. And they're another thing that is very popular to fish, but a lot of them are also in trouble, but can benefit from those marine protected areas that we highlighted earlier. Now, also in the kelp forest, actually, Olivia, if you wouldn't mind um, taking off our little question thing here, because I think one of the other fish that I want to point out is sort of blocked down there at the bottom, down over here. That is the Garibaldi. And that's another really, really popular fish to see when you go diving around Southern California, because they are sort of an exception. They do get a really bright orange color when they grow up, and they're very, very fun to see on dives. These are the California State Marine Fish. And these guys kind of have a little bit of a, a fun personality, we'll say. They're a type of damselfish, and damselfish can be a little bit territorial. So if you go diving and you happen to see some of these adults sort of hovering around their caves in the rock and you get a little bit too close, they will let you know because they want you to know that this is their home and um, they'll give you a little bit of a warning, but they're a whole lot of fun and a whole lot of um, really cool to see on your dive. And when they're tiny, when they're young, they look a whole lot different. So kind of sheephead look different when they're growing up. 
Garibaldi, they'll be tiny, they'll be orange, but they'll have these really, really beautiful blue spots. And so it's always a treat to see some of the younger ones swimming around the kelp forest as well. So let's go ahead and go back finally one more time to our uh, blue cavern cam and kind of wrap up some of the different things that we've talked about today. Now first, we talked about what is kelp, right? Kelp is super important because without the kelp, there's no kelp forest. Now kelp forest behaves a whole lot like a plant carrying out photosynthesis using sunlight to provide the base of the food chain for our kelp forest. And we talked about some of those structures like the hold fast it uses to attach us to the rock, those little gas bladders to keep it floating up, and then those stipes or the um, blades, which are kind of like the, the leaves of a plant to help it carry out photosynthesis. And then we talked about one of the kelp predators, our sea urchin, a really cool spiky creature that roam around the bottom of the kelp forest, eating away at some of the kelp, but they're also a very important food source for some of our key predators like our California sheephead that we talked about, that awesome sex changing fish. This is our guy here again, one of my favorites. And then of course we talked about our sea otters as well, which like I said, are not here in Southern California, but potentially if we continue to help them out through our various protections, hopefully we can see their ranges expand and so they can help us to restore the health of our ocean backyard of our kelp forest. And then finally, we highlighted some other cool animals like our giant sea bass that are also in need of some assistance, but those marine protected areas are really doing a good job to help them out. And then we highlighted our Garibaldi and some other fish like our leopard sharks as well. And all, we are only really scratching the surface of the biodiversity that you would find in a kelp forest. Because like I said, hundreds, thousands of different species rely on the kelp forest for their home. And that's why it's very important for us to do everything we can to protect it. Now, not only can you support things like the creation of MPAs or the, or the creation of legislation that promotes responsible fishing, but you can also make sure that when you're at home, for example, watching what we um, drop in our drains, because a lot of that runs off right into our local oceans, right? So being aware of those kind of things. And you can also participate in things like beach cleanups. That's a great way to get involved. You can go out to one of our local beaches, help to clean up, because like I said, that kelp forest is right under the water and when you're at many of our local Southern California beaches. And also, just share what you've learned. Hopefully you have learned something new today about our kelp forest or about one of the really cool animals that relies on the kelp forest. Share that with someone and help to uh, spread the word about how cool our local ecosystems are and how we can protect it. So thank you so much for joining us today at our Aquarium Online Academy. We look forward to seeing you again soon. If you have any questions, once again, folks, you can email us at live at LBAP in case you missed the stream. And if there was any classes joining us today or any summer camps or anything like that, and you had a group of students watching, we would love to hear how many students were joining us. You can also use that number there and text us how many people were joining us. So thanks again and have a wonderful day. Um, we're here signing off here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. We hope to see you again soon.